Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Padilla. I'm Mirai's head of Latin, and uh, I'm sharing this webinar with Olmo. He's the CEO and co-founder of Mirai. And uh, we want to, to thank you all for staying there uh, on the other side uh, of this webinar. Um, please feel free to, to share your thoughts, to send your uh, questions. We're going to answer your questions at the end of the of the presentation, but uh, feel free to to ask uh, whatever you want. And uh, you can also contact us after the webinar. Feel free uh, if you want to further um, something. Please feel free. Um, we want to talk about ALM. We want to talk about ALM, but from a practical approach. Uh, so I'm going to start introducing us. Let me see. Yes, who we are. Um, we are Mirai. Mirai was founded in 2013, so seven years ago, and we are specialized in ALM. Um, we have been developing ALM solutions from 2013 uh, in these seven years. Uh, please, Olmo, please, could you mute your... Yes. Thank you. <laughs> we have been developing uh, ALM solutions since then, since 2013, during this last seven years. Um, most of us came from other consultancy firms, so our personal experience is even wider, uh, always with ALM, FTP, and Capital. Um, we have been developing these solutions in Europe and America. Uh, now we have four offices, one in Spain, USA, Mexico, and Chile. And uh, we are a part of a group of three companies, uh, which are Mirai, Biagic. Biagic is specialized in business intelligence solutions and new technologies and Tadaima. Tadaima is a graphic design studio, so we all compound this, this group. Um, um, what are we going to talk about? We are going to talk about ALM, of course. Um, ALM, from our point of view, is quite important, but even more during crisis, and we are now in a huge uh, crisis, so um, is now uh, something everybody wants to talk about. Um, but we don't want to talk about ALM from an academic uh, perspective. Uh, this is because we are probably not the best ones. If you want to learn more about ALM from an academic perspective, then BTRM is the answer. It, of course, they are hosting our webinar. I cannot say other things, but I, I truly believe that. Uh, they have excellent teachers. I don't know what you know, Murat Chaudhry, for example. This, uh, he knows everything about ALM. So um, this is my advice. Uh, we want to talk more from, from our experience. Um, we want to talk about technology, of course. There, there has been a huge evolution in technology during the last 10 years, more or less and we want to tell you how to take advantage of that. And we also want to share our experience uh, developing these ALM solutions and trying to share with you what we think that are the key aspects or the critical components to have a successful ALM project. So we are not talking about regulation, not at all. Regulation is boring. It's uh, it's huge. Uh, it is not the point today. Um, and we don't want to focus just on the current situation. Uh, I just said that ALM is even more important during crisis. That's right. But ALM is more than just something we have to focus during crisis. Uh, so if you have questions about regulation or uh, the current situation, please feel free, send them but we don't want to focus just on that, okay? So um, I'm going to start by telling you why I think that ALM is important. The first 
the first uh, reason is risks. It's obvious. Uh, when we talk about ALM, we are talking about interest rate risk, and we are talking about liquidity risk. Um, as you may know, interest rate risk has a huge impact on your value and on your margin, your p &L. So it is important to control and hedging your interest rate risk. And liquidity risk, uh, this is easy to see. Uh, it is important not just for banks, not just for financial institutions, but for every company. Uh, you, if you have problems with your liquidity, uh, you could lead to a bankruptcy to your company. So it's quite important to control your liquidity, to get a liquidity buffer, and get a well-diversified funding. So the second reason, um, I'm currently living in Santiago de Chile, and before that I was living in Mexico City. And from so my my experience in ALM is mainly uh, based here in Latin America. And what I see is that this is probably the main reason why a bank uh, takes the decision to have a new uh, ILM software, a new ILM solution. Uh, it used to be this reason. And what is this? Uh, since uh, Basel published their guidance, their uh, Basel II and Basel III, the local authorities here in Latin America, there are, of course, different cases, different countries, different kind of banks. But uh, when they see that the local authorities are uh, trying to adapt that uh, guidelines to their local banking sector, uh, this is like an alert. Uh, and they start to think about a new LM solution. Uh, we need software. We need to get the reports. We need to fulfill those uh, regulatory requirements, so they start to think about a new solution. This is perfectly understandable. Um, it's normal because if you don't fulfill those requirements, you are going to face huge problem. So uh, it is perfectly understandable. But in our opinion, in our experience, sometimes we forget this third reason and probably it should be the, the uh, most important one. Uh, uh, there are some banks that think that uh, if you want a new ALM solution, this is just an expense. And this is not correct. Uh, ALM should be uh, the results of a new ALM solution should be reflected on your PL. You don't be on your PL, you should be more profitable. Uh, in ways that, when you choose an ALM uh, solution or an ALM tool, uh, you have to be sure that you can simulate all kinds of scenarios and all kinds of what ifs. So, uh, this is not about predicting the future, no one can do that. This is about simulate all kinds of scenarios. So you have all the information to make the, uh, the best decision possible to, to understand what may happen in the future. So about scenarios, uh, you have to consider shocks in your interest rate curves, uh, different kind, parallel, stepper and flatter, all kind of shocks. Um, you have to consider as well changes in your financial behaviors or your customer behaviors. We all know that we do not behave the same way during crisis periods uh, and during uh, normal periods. So your customers are changing their behavior. You have to uh, pay attention to that and you have to uh, simulate those changes in, uh, in your uh, ILM software. And <clears throat> you have also to uh, consider all kinds of scenarios for your new business. It is okay to have your data to, uh, to get your runoff or your balance sheet, but you have to 
simulate all kind of new scenarios, uh, new business scenarios, uh, not just your budget, but um, all kind of possibilities. And about what ifs, uh, this is something that sometimes it is not even considered, but you need a solution that allow you to simulate uh, all kind of business strategies. That's what we mean by uh, what ifs. Before you go to a market and buy something or sell something or do all kind of operations, uh, you should be able to simulate the impact of that operations in your balance sheet okay, in terms of liquidity, in terms of value, in terms of uh, regulatory, regulatory right, radius, uh, everything. Okay, uh, The most information you get uh the better decision you you may you may take um so let's think i'm gonna think that i have convinced you about to get a new lm solution or why lm is important now the the following question is okay how how do we build that uh, alm solution uh for well, there are some different steps. Um, the first one, in our experience, when we talk with clients, uh, they always are thinking about uh, their results, reporting. Uh, it, uh, that's okay, I understand that because it's, uh, it's their business, they have to uh, take decisions, so they need more information, more accurate information. Uh, better information. So I understand that you think at the end of the, uh, the whole process, the results, the, the uh, reports. Okay, but we have to start by the beginning. And the first step is to get an ALM policy. And this is important because uh, we have to start by knowledge and expertise. And sometimes we see that there are some um, clients that they agree they want a new ALM policy, so they hire a consultancy firm, that's okay for us. But uh, when you want a new ALM policy, you have to be involved on the definition of that uh, ALM policy. You cannot let all the work uh, to the consultants because they can uh, they can get the expertise, they can get the knowledge from other banks, from the whole market, from other countries. That's okay. But no one knows the bank, no one knows your bank better than you, than yourself. So you have to be involved in the definition, you have to, to, uh, to uh, supervise the work of your uh, consultants. And, what do we settle in this uh, ALM policy? Well, we have to establish the limits, the limits of our risks or our risk appetite, and how are we going to control that we uh, keep those limits. Um, the second one is governance. This is quite important as well. Uh, ALM is something that affects the whole company, the whole bank. So it is important to define a good governance of your ALM function. And the third one is contingency plans, of course. Uh, there are crisis times, we all know, so you may have contingency plans to, to face those uh, stress periods. Um, there is a second part, part that sometimes it is forgotten and it is financial behaviors. Um, when we talk uh, mainly with uh, small banks, um, they say, okay, but I don't really know what's the, uh, the uh, okay. Uh, I don't really know what's the, um, what's the exact model of uh, my non-maturing deposits, for example. Um, there's no problem. You have to start by something. Uh, define a, an easier model, but you have to start. Um, 
So define model for your financial behavior, for your customer, for your products. And then when you have an historical data, when you have this uh, uh, some uh, well, some historical data, then you can uh, get back for, um, to make a back test into to your data and to uh, stress your models and improve your models. But you need to start by something. So the third part is control and updates. Uh, that's obvious. You have to to get your reporting and you have to back test your your definitions to keep them updated uh, at all times. And the the second step from uh, our point of view is human capital. This is something that may sound uh, too obvious, and we hope it is, but sometimes uh, it is not. So we think that you should keep your human resources motivated, trained, and organized. And you may think, uh, of course, of course, we all want our team members motivated, trained, and organized. But let's think a little bit farther. When I say motivated, um, I assume that you all are working in the financial and financial sector. So we are normally well paid. Uh, so when we talk about motivated, we are not thinking about salary. We are not thinking about this kind of problem. We are thinking about the tasks that our uh, team members are doing on a daily basis. And what we see is that sometimes uh, our clients spend time, spend much time in tasks that do not add much value to the to the ALM process. For example, data quality. We have seen many people in banks who uh, take much, uh, who spend uh, much time in seeing whether their contracts are right or no, whether they have more errors or quality scale. This is something that could be automatized with uh, software. And you have a report where you see whether your contracts or your uh, data is okay or not, and you, um, you have to fix it or not. But try not to spend time on that. Uh, another example, reporting. Try not to spend much time in collecting your data, organize your data, or preparing reports. If you have an option which uh, uh, offers you integrated reporting, this is much time that you save and you can dedicate to other tasks, like, uh, as I mentioned before, um, simulating. That's much more important for ALM simulate all kind of scenarios, simulate all kind of uh, business strategies, what is, this is uh, much more important to ALM than uh, uh, seeing whether your data is okay or you have many errors. The second one is train. And uh, again, I'm not talking about paying your employees an MBA or a, a certificate or whatever. That's okay, that's right. But when we talk about training is when you select software, when you select a whole solution, even when you select a consultancy firm, try to get the better, not just because of their features, not just because of their cost, but also because of their learning curve. Uh, if you hire a software that you cannot understand, uh, okay, they have uh, all kind of features, but you cannot understand that. It is uh, quite difficult to learn how to manage uh, the software. Or you are going to hire a consultancy firm to implement that solution, but you are not going to participate during the implementation and you hope that at the end you get all the knowledge and you control the, the new software. That's not the solution. You have to be involved from the very beginning 
you have to be sure that you understand the software, that you can manage the software. So when consultants go home, you can manage, you can simulate your your different scenarios, you can update your models, you can uh, easily uh, manage your new your new software. And the third one is the organization. Um, again, um, it is important to dedicate time. Okay, um, for us, it's it's great to uh, get a client who says, okay, uh, you do that task. Uh, we hire a consultancy firm, so they implement the solution, they define it, they prove it, they everything. But uh, as I said no one knows your entity better than yourself or if if you don't know something there's probably uh, something from business unit who can help you to understand how your uh, customers behave for example but you have to dedicate time to understand the new solution to define uh, the new solution together with the the expert the consultant uh, whoever, but you have to dedicate time from the very beginning. And this is also quite important. You need to get the support from executive members. As I said, ALM, it is uh, something that affects the whole entity, the whole bank, the whole company. So uh, you have to be reporting to uh, the executive committee, to the risk management committee, to the Assets and Liabilities Committee. So you need their support. You need them to understand what you are doing, the new solution, to be sure that the new solution fulfills all their needs. Okay, so it is important that the whole organization is uh, supporting the, the new solution. Okay. And the next one, I'm going to be explained uh, by Olmo, so mm -hmm. Olmo. Yeah, thank you very much, Jose. Um, and thank you everyone for being today here. And um, as I Jose said, uh, today what I'm going to try to do is to explain specific key factor to secure a successful ALM project. I put here four different bullet points. Obviously, every single entity is different. Every single project is different. Some of them has data quality issues. Some of them has model issues. Some of them has uh, <clears throat> a tool issues. It depends. What I try, what I'm gonna try to explain is uh, give you a most like realistic project that we probably suffer, right? And and thinking about is after many months thinking, much regretting the lack of infrastructure. With when we have the regulator uh, knocking, uh, knocking to our doors, internal audit model saying, okay, you need to start enhancing your system, etc. The bank finally decide to make a significant investment, updating our current system or renovating our current uh, LM practices or both. And as I Jose said, maybe the head of ALM feels supported by the organization and those with the responsibilities enough the responsibilities to tackle the project and having the enough resources. That's the ideal world. But we all know that probably we will have other situations than that, right? Because among its main tax of their business as usual, they have uh, to do other things like choose an LM engine. How you can choose an LM engine? Because uh, some, some years ago, uh, we, or you have like, less option, but right now there are many options in the market that are really great. Um, second one, define uh, data provisioning and regulation and reconciliation strategy is where should I get my data? Is, is it going to be a data warehousing? Is it going to be a data lake? I should go through the uh, source system. It's like many aspects that we need to take into account to make that decision. And obviously the head of ALM needs to be involved on that. Right, because we they need to define timing, they need to define uh, the recognition strategy, etc. The third one, and it's not the less important, is design the LM model. Right, what is going to be the chart of account that I'm going to implement in my LM system? What is going to be the dimensionality that I need to uh, implement my models, or what is going to be my models? 
right? And no maturity, prepayments, default, many of them, right? And is that each of these decisions will largely depend on, obviously, on the risk or LM policies, as Jose mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, and they will have implication on how well ALM will be addressed, right? Because until now, probably ALCO and the head of ALM has been working with a deficient or simply sufficient data platform. Maybe, maybe not, but uh, can be, right? Uh, they have had to make assumptions uh, without having the best information available, and sometimes they don't have enough credibility with ALCO member to make the decision. But where should I st start? Before starting, in my opinion, and I think that in our opinion as well, uh, we have to manage expectation. And what I'm talking here is that what that kind of problem is the project not going to solve? Because, you know, this is a technology solution that we're going to have uh, the, all the information on the balance sheet, and maybe we have a uh, different stakeholder that they want to be involved in, this, in, in the decision. Like, for example, people from credit risk, I don't know, people from uh, Treasury, but not ALN, the trading portfolio, et cetera. It's something that we need to manage the at the early beginning, because it's important really to focus priorities to avoid, first of all, misunderstanding, because uh, in the middle of the project, we may have a, a different situation, right? Um, and also uh, to try to avoid interference or deviation that only will harm the achievement of our goal. Otherwise, we will see discouragement, frustration, and probably we'll have our uh, project in paralysis, or we will have a failure in the project at the, at the end, and we don't want that, right? And what, I, what I'm going to do is I, propose, I, I will propose the following premises for managing expectation. First of all, we don't have to seek immediate perfection, right? I think that it's really important to design a workable plan that ensures reasonable goals were still allowing for scalability, right? If we try to cover everything, uh, we have so many requirements from different uh, departments, uh, and maybe we are, we're going to jeopardize the success of our project, because if we try to cover everything, it's going to be impossible. Therefore, I think that we need to identify the reason that led you to the conclusion of starting your project when that happened. Revaluate the main problem you seek to solve, and do not let, and this is important, the circumstances, uh, once the journey has been taken, uh, alter the arrival of our destination, right? Because we will see many, many people, or many people asking, or many people uh, giving their opinions into our project. Second one is find a reasonable starting point and start. It's likely that probably at the early beginning it's impossible to cover everything and to try to solve all the problems that we may face, right? And that's, that's fine. Right? It's like because it won't always happen, right? And I think that an integral part of the project, I think that involves managing uh, something that we don't have in our paper, something that we didn't take into consideration uh, at the early beginning or the beginning of the project. But in my opinion, waiting is not the best formula because we have a specific timeline that we need to address. We have a stakeholder that they are going to ask us for results. And I think that we need to keep going, to keep going, to keep going. And for example, if you already have a simulation system, but are concerned that the model is not robust enough for the degree of certification that the ALCO and the regulatory environment demands, I think that what we can do is start by talking uh, to other banks that have such systems, right? I think that uh, our your peers, obviously, will uh, help you in that uh, in that regard. But it is star if, on the other hand, you are concerned that information infrastructure is precarious, is not enough. That, for example, the commercial information is only moderately good, and that you invest a large part of your time cleaning process, uh, cleaning the information in, on the portfolios, etc. Et start by rethinking the provisioning process and developing alternative plans that eliminate the lack of information. But as I said, we need to start. We 
need to start. Like, don't don't wait until until everything is 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 clear. Third one from the start, start by solving information problem. I think that this is the most critical question. The reality is that all these projects as are subject to the quality of the information. Quality means data lineage to the source system. Then the simulation system respects the same parameters that that is in the source data, right? For example, amortization code, the coupon, the spread, the maturity date, right? Um, in this, and well, yes, and quality means absolutely a quality critical definition of a provisioning perimeter and the accounting reconciliation. I think that in this way, with quality and conciliation, we will achieve the necessary credibility to make decisions, to debate and argue with the members of, the, of our ALCO the most appropriate corrective decision and to justify to the regulator, auditor, et cetera, the reasonable of our decision. Because finally, data is the credibility of our project and obviously and ultimately all, the, all of our financial uh, decision or all of our financial report that we're going to actually share with the ALCO. And the last one, I think that this, the project is a marathon and it's not a sprint. And we know that there are emergencies, there are agencies. Some of them are what have motivated the project, absolutely. But we cannot resign ourselves to this anxiety. Uh, for me, the less recommended is a project with a big aspiration. Moving from a place to sense, and sorry for the, for the word, to the 21st century, for example, within one year, invites mainly costly mistakes, right? And I think that uh, what can and should be done is a scalable project, as I have mentioned previously, obviously, with intermediate objectives of one, two, and three years from now, right? But I think that it's imperative that we are realistic in the process. The project, obviously, is expensive, it's complex. But it can be even more if we let our souls be carried away by the rush and the urgency of the short term. And I think that for me is the, the, the w w like the, the key factor that we need to take into account when we are actually executing uh, this kind of project. Obviously, there are many more, and as we said at the beginning, please feel free to send us any question regarding this. Uh, and, and now the presenter, yes, okay, perfect. Um, now, what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna try to talk about uh, the technology evolution and how this technology can be applied uh, within our system, right? And I'm gonna be bringing up this like a high level, but uh, we really like this uh, slide because it will tell us uh, how fast the technology is moving. For example, the first cellular phone, uh, or the first phone made on a hundred cellular was made on, a, on April 3, on 1973, right? Uh, Terra Data in 1984, uh, they released it's, uh, it's called DBC 1012 Specialized Database Computer in 1984, absolutely, and it's the first database that is able to store massive data. And that's a key thing, right? After, before that, it was impossible. In 1993, uh, the Excel version 5 uh, was uh, published. And it was the, the first time that Microsoft included Visual Basic for application, that all, all of us know, obviously, that will add the, well, which had the ability to automate tasks in Excel and provide the user-defined function for using worksheet. This is the base of the tool that we have today. And if I have to bet, probably this is our main tool in our day-to-day -day basis. And we're talking about technology of 1993. And in 1996, Ralph Kilbal uh, published the Data Warehouse Toolkit. The Data Warehouse Toolkit is the foundation of the informational system that we know today. We're talking about data warehousing, data mar, et cetera. Also, in 1996, the DVD was created. The DVD was created right now is something that is not, well, it's extinct. No one is using DVD. Um, in 1998, uh, Google was founded in, uh, by Larry Page and Sergey Brin. 
uh, while they were PhD students at Stanford. In 1988, we're talking about uh, almost 22 years. And for, for me, it's like yesterday. <laughs> and in 2004, uh, Google created MapReduce. MapReduce actually, I think that we can consider this event as the beginning of the big data. Right now, uh, I think that from 2017, they are not using any more MapReduce. They are using for probably other, other software like Spark or whatever, right? But in 2004, MapReduce was the was that who was uh, actually uh, uh, created. And when we think that is the beginning of the area, the big data. In 2007, Apple creates the iPhone, right? In March 2016, AlphaGo uh, beat Lee Sido that in a five-game match, and it was the first time a computer Go program has beaten a nine-done professional without handicap. And this is the new era of the, obviously, Internet of Things. Uh, I think that probably most of you has like an Alexa or an uh, Google Home at your, at your place or and, and for example, or using your Google Maps uh, or your ways to to guide through the road, etc. All of this information, all of this software, sorry, not information, are using this kind of technology, right? And this is the technology that we have today. And I think that this is the way in our today that we, how we interact with technology. And I think that it's time to start transferring this technology to our system, to our professional system. In in, in this case, in ALM, obviously. And, I, and here, what I try to put is something that, for me, is key when we are choosing an, an ALM solution. The first of all is a microservice architecture. I, I don't know if you know, but uh, the key advantage of microservices is that the system can be split in microprocessors, right, yeah, for example. And, and I think that uh, and which one are the key advantage of this new architecture? First one is scalability. Right, when we are also splitting our process in microprocessors, everyone is implemented and deployed independently of each other. They run with independent process and they can be monitored and scaled independently. What does it mean? We can have parallel execution. Uh, uh, yeah, we can have uh, parallel development uh, without affecting uh, the, the core solution of our system, etc. Second one that probably for me is, is most important than, than scalability, that is also important, is continuous integration. Because as our system is split into microprocess, I can deploy fixes, enhancement, new functionality, new releases uh, without service interruptions. Probably if many of you guys are uh, ALM solution user and probably you, you have to, to spend three, four months to implement a new release of a legacy system and, and probably hire a consulting firm to help you with the UAT, et cetera, and then finally deploy. But with microservices, as we are actually changing a specific or microprocesses, you can deploy it independently without any service interruption. Second one is cloud computing. And I think that uh, we have heard many things about cloud, and I know that especially in the financial institution, uh, financial institution uh, there were like a lot of worries about using public clouds. But the truth is that right now the banks are transitioning toward public clouds because obviously it has like many key, key advantages. The third one for me is uh, one, is not, one of them, it's not the third one, sorry, is time to market, right? Uh, we can have infrastructure ready in hours or days, and, and probably you suffer, uh, start budgeting, start acquiring that service, configuring, etc. That is a process between months and probably one year or two years. It depends on, on how big is the service that we want to, to, to install. Second one is the system availability, right? We don't have anymore to be worried about uh, duplication of CPDs, etc., because they will take care of that, and they are doing that for other uh, entities as well. Third one, the optimization, right? Is we will only pay what we are using, not anymore. We don't have a fixed cost. And you know that, for example, for in, in, in alien process, uh, you are not using your alien system every single day. Probably you will have days where you are not, don't have to open it. Why do you have to pay if you are not using that? 
The fourth one, that for me probably is the, the most important one, is scaling. And I think that is one of the biggest features is the ability to scale. And there are different ways to accomplish the scaling. One is vertical scaling and the other is horizontal scaling. And what is the difference between these two? Vertical is the ability to increase the capacity of existing hardware or software by adding resources, right? But we will be limited uh, by the fact that you can only get as big as your site of jobs of the server. The second one is the horizontal, and I think that is, this is the key one, and that is the ability to connect multiple hardware or software entities, and our capacity is, is almost endless. But let me provide, I know that it's like a really technology, tech, IT concept. I will provide you a, an example that is probably uh, easier to, to understand. And, and in this Two examples I read in an IBM article, that is great. Uh, the first one is, is uh, vertical. It's imagine an apartment building that has many rooms and floors where people move in and out all the time. In this apartment building, we have only 200 spaces, but not all are taken at one time. So in a sense, the apartment scales vertically as more people come, and there are rooms to accommodate them, but as long as the 200 space capacity is not exceed. It's okay. The, our limit is going to be 200 space, and that is vertical uh, uh, scaling. When we're talking about horizontal scaling, imagine a two-lane expressway. The expressway is good to handle the 2,000 or so vehicles that travel the expressway. As commerce begins to expand, we have more buildings that are constructed and more homes are built. As a result, we are coming from 102,000 to 8,000. We may have a problem, or well, we have a problem. Uh, this makes a uh, major traffic jam during rush hour. We probably have an increase in accident, etc. But the expressway can be scaled horizontally by constructing more lanes and quite possibly adding another path. In this, obviously, in this example, the construction will take some time. But uh, much like scaling your product horizontally, you add additional machines to your environment, right? It's, it's, it's because you are actually, yeah, you are adding to your, to your right more system and your capacity is bigger now. And obviously, this requires planning and make sure you have resources available. And most important thing is that your architecture can handle this scalability. And here, the microservice architecture is something that is key. Big data, I think that all of, all of us uh, listen a lot of things of big data. As you know, finally, big data is a field that there is a way to analyze, extract information from uh, the large data sets, et cetera, that uh, without or with traditional data processing application, it wasn't impossible. An advanced reporting layer, uh, now we have new data analytics tools uh, that will give us the better capabilities to create a doc uh, report with drill down capabilities to ensure the data lineage process, etc., and also analysis at a higher granular level, right? For me, what is the key benefits of being native in new technologies, right? Uh, first of all, end to end. I think that uh, many, many tools already in the market, they have, uh, well, let, let me start uh, from the beginning. Typically, when we were developing our own LM solution, we have three different layers, right? The first one is data provisioning, where we are actually uh, implementing specific data quality rules, adjustment, et cetera. We have our ALM engine. And finally, we have to build or develop another extra layer uh, for an advanced reporting uh, system, right? Where we can actually uh, start creating our own report, et cetera, right? Right now, the capabilities of the new technologies give us the opportunity to have everyone in one unique system, right? And it will make our life easier, your life cheaper, and much straightforward. Optimization of the computation time. Having the proper architecture, as I said, is key for scaling our system. We can optimize our computing times. Right now, with the, the power that we have in, in cloud public, like 
can be Amazon, can be Google, can be whatever you want. Uh, it's almost endless, right? It's to, to wait for hours is something that uh, needs to end, right? The technology gives us the opportunity to cut drastically that computing times from hours to, to minutes and also increase the granularity of our data. The third one is the balance between cost and performance. Uh, because, and, and this is something that, uh, uh, on, and this problem that we have is when we were actually implementing legacy systems, you were thinking about what is your needs on that time. Okay, I need, uh, for example, 20, uh, 240 cores to run my simulation. Okay, but maybe you don't need them. Maybe it's much more or maybe it's much less, right? Uh, with, within cloud, it's something that you can balance between cost and performance. And if you need to re-engineer or to add new capacity, it's something that you can do at any time, right? Because you are combining both cloud and the proper architecture to be able to scale. The next one is, as I said, is a continuous integration. And it doesn't make any sense, for example, that uh, I have a cell phone. Every single morning, I have an alert saying me, you can update uh, 20 applications. Or, for example, our uh, operating system, our Windows, uh, our Linux, whatever. We have a, a, a functionality that is telling me, do you want to upgrade or, or your update your operating system, and you will click it, and you will have it in within minutes, and sometimes with hours, but within minutes, you will have that update done in your computer. And operating system is one of the most complex systems in the world, but it's not like an ILM system. Why, does it, why we cannot do the same uh, on ILM, right? With this kind of architecture, you are going to be able to deploy this kind of uh, fixed functionality, etc. Second one is time to market cut drastically. Uh, typically, the time of having new infrastructure on premise really can take months. And also, not only, only time, it's like we need the proper skill uh, to configure, to support it, etc. And we know that this is something that is scarce in the market and it's expensive, right? But public clouds and software as a services model will allow us to have the tool ready between hours and days. And also the support and the maintenance will cover by that specific uh, model. Second one is data and it is an alternative model, right? Uh, I, sorry for for it, pity me, but uh, in the same tool you can have better data analytics capabilities and start thinking of implementing new things or improving your models, right? Because it's going to be everything in, in one unique system. Imagine having data lineage, complete data lineage from your transaction to your results, to your regulatory reporting. What kind of analysis we can do? We can do backtesting. We can do uh, analysis of our uh, prepayments, or we can do analysis for how our normative deposits are behaving. And, and we can see what is the sensitivity, sensitivity of our current model with actually what is going to happen. Well, this is backtesting, absolutely. Or if we, we like it, we can start thinking of implementing alternative models uh, using data science and artificial intelligence and machine learning, having everything in one unique system. And I think that that's something that uh, uh, is really feasible with the technology that we have today. And well, I think that uh, that's all what we have today on, on my side. Uh, I think that we have uh, one a question. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for your attention, uh, and I hope you are having a, a great summer. I know that it's a difficult situation because of the COVID, and but everyone will uh, hope that everyone is, is healthy, etc. Uh, yes, I think that we have a question. Hi, Jose Olmo. Uh, I have found that we are sometimes in front of customers who want to invest. Almost, in yeah. almost sorry. Uh, while you read the question and you think about the answer, let me just make a little disclosure. Yeah. Because we have been talking about Mirai, but you see here MIT, Matt. Matt is our engine. Uh, we have our own ALM software. Um, uh, which obviously complies with all those requirements. 
And if you uh, want to go farther, you want to uh, get more information about this uh, ALM software, uh, please feel free, feel free to contact us through our emails, through LinkedIn, um, our website, uh, whatever. So, uh, yes, now you can answer the question. Sorry. Uh, yeah, let me. Yeah, is there an, who wants to uh, have you go? Well, I have found that we are sometimes front of customer who want to invest in LM software but do not have an LM policy. Have you come across this issue before? How did you manage this? Yes, uh, many times. <laughs> Uh, because in, in specific areas, uh, the ALM is not it's not a common practice, and, and they are actually starting this journey. Uh, the first thing is that we do what we call PDP or a plan director, where we sit together. We try to analyze what is the current situation of, of their of their of that of this specific entity, and we plan and we plan well uh, a project. Uh, taking into account that the first thing that they have to do is to define this ALM policy, right? It can be ALM policy, it can be an uh, ALM model, or, or whatever, right? But they have really to, first of all, to understand what ALM is, understand what is their balance, the product behavior, and what they have to achieve. And this is the first thing that we do in this kind of project. If not, it's impossible. If we start uh, an implementation without a uh, white paper, uh, probably, first of all, our clients won't never uh, believe in our results, won't never uh, be comfortable with the model when, because finally the model the, should be them, should be owned by them, right? Uh, and I think that that first stack or that critical thing is the way that they need to, to achieve first. Okay, we have a second one. Uh, do you know of tools that are full software as a service service? Web service rather than RDP or traditional host solution. Normally, the only way to get a data after solution will require a data LT layer deferring the API driven text. Well, our solution is a full software as a service service. I, probably there are more in the market, but always you will require uh, to fulfill a specific uh, data interface. And because there is not a magic box, right? And I think that uh, every single solution. Sorry. I, I lost. Uh, yes, what I'm saying is that even if a full software as a service application, you probably need to have an ETL or an extraction from your uh, data sources to an specific data interface. Or maybe you can use, uh, there are like really good uh, rule engines in the market. Um, I think that, uh, for example, I have some, someone that is called Decision, et cetera, that they also are full software as a service that can be also complement this, this specific ALM solution. But always you will require to, to start the information from your source system and to map to, to what actually the tool needs. I don't know if I answer your question. Both of you guys. <laughs> Just uh, about the first one, the one from Mustang about the ALM policy. I would like just to say that, uh, as almost said before, uh, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. So we have to let them understand that yes, you need an ALM policy, but this is. This doesn't mean that from the very beginning you need to have your models 100% accurate to the reality. Uh, you have to start by something. So you can define uh, more easy models and start by uh, uh, implementing the new ALM solution, start by generating historical data, and then you'll be able to do uh, back testing and check whether these uh, models could be improved uh, and how. So it's yeah. important. That's why it's important that your ALM software uh, save 
uh, the the information, the results, the, well, the the um, data supply and the results. So yeah. you can then do the back testing properly and yeah. and see whether your models are right. And, and, and also, Mustafa, if if you have uh, any question, um, you probably a, a consultant. I think that we can share our experience with you anytime. Right? You can find us through our email, through LinkedIn. We will be happy to help. And I think that it's also, as I said, uh, to to the LM heads, etc., that they need to reach out their peers. We need to do the same <laughs> with our peers. Uh, then feel free. Okay, I think that is two minutes to go. If you don't have any question. Well, thank you very much for uh, giving, your, giving us your attention. It was a pleasure to work with BDRM. That is an, incre it's an incredible academy, and as Jose said, and you know, uh, we are, you can contact us through this email, or if you can, would like to check our website, it will really appreciate that. And thank you very much, everyone. Have a, a great Thursday. Uh, thank you very much, Jose. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Ed, for your, for your help hosting yeah. this webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Jose and Alma, as well. And obviously, for everybody else, if you go to the BTRM website, you'll see our other webinars that we're running. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye.